Yes, with respect to responsibility in particular, our understanding of what history and tradition reflect and how this court has used the term is that it's identifying those whose possession of firearms presents an unusual danger beyond the ordinary citizen. And again, I would draw the, the analogy to sensitive places and to dangerous and unusual weapons. In each of these contexts, the court is trying to identify those arms that are especially dangerous, those places where carrying weapons will pose unique dangers, and those categories of people who beyond the ordinary citizen in, possess a, a particular danger if they have access to firearms. So it's not a synonym for virtue? No, we're so not you're invoking not pulling a, in the virtuous citizenry. We are not. No, we think that here there is a direct link under the responsible citizens principle to danger. And we think that the disarmament provision I'm defending here, Section 922 G8, clearly satisfies that link because it requires individualized findings of dangerousness and a legislative consensus that individuals in this category present the requisite level of danger. Well, and how do you know? I mean, I think there would be little dispute that someone who was. Um, guilty, say, or even had a restraining order, that domestic violence is dangerous. Okay. So someone who poses a risk of domestic violence is dangerous. How does the government go about showing whether certain behavior qualifies as dangerous? Because this might be in a heartland, but then you can imagine more marginal cases. So you've invoked the consensus among the states, tradition of dangerousness, and I don't think you'd get a lot of pushback because this is violence, after all, domestic violence. What about more marginal cases? So I think that the factors we think courts could apply in this context, and I should emphasize that this is subject to meaningful judicial review, would fall into a couple of different categories. At the outset, I would take the class of disarmament provisions that require individualized findings of dangerousness and say those fall in the heartland, as you just suggested. We have a judicial order here that specifically found that Mr. Rahimi's conduct was dangerous to his intimate partner. Then I think you get to the category of cases where a legislature might be making categories Categorical predictive judgments that individuals with a certain characteristic or quality or past conduct present a danger. And those, I think, can be harder cases. But the factors I would point to first would be the breadth of the law, because we know that the Second Amendment was, entire, was intended to prevent disarming wide swaths of the American public. So if it's sweeping broadly or indiscriminately and capturing people we think of as ordinary citizens, that's going to be a problem. Next, I would look at the justifications and the evidence before the legislature. This would operate like sensitive places. You could look and see, is that place, in fact, dangerous if there are weapons there? So too, you could look at the evidence the legislature was consulting with respect to its judgment of dangerousness. And then the third factor would be that legislative consensus. And I don't want to suggest that this is dispositive either way, because some legislatures can be the first mover. And if multiple legislatures enact an unconstitutional law, that doesn't give you a safe harbor. But I do think that legislatures are best positioned to make these kinds of predictive judgments about dangerousness. And if you have the kind of consensus that we see here with respect to Section 922 G8, that's entitled to a lot of weight in the analysis. And I don't want to say, Justice Barrett, that this is always going to be easy and that these factors will cash out in obvious ways. I would say that I think that this is not a close case and that Section 922 G8 is clearly constitutional and fits within the category of disarming irresponsible citizens under these principles. 